wanted to begin with the two synthetic clay liners. Uh, I, I got into this working with these materials about 1997. That shows the gray hair on my head. Um, I, almost by accident. You know, like many interesting things in my career, through a system that, where we had a failure that wasn't working. And I began to learn about these materials and where they worked and where they didn't work. And it became apparent to me that it was pretty remarkable that we could take something that's about the size of my index finger thick that comes in a roll that's a, essentially like a carpet, right? Roll it out, and within a couple of weeks of natural hydration on a subgrade, create something that's essentially impervious, like a meter thick uh, clay liner that uh, takes us a great deal much of energy and time and attention to detail to construct. We can build with something that simple to deploy, and it can work that remarkable, particularly taking a dry product that comes off a truck and it transforms itself, as we'll see in a minute, into something that's impermeable. And we can take and essentially replace a meter-thick compacted clay barrier with a finger-thick GCL, saving airspace, saving construction time, and do that in both cover applications and in liner applications. Different animals. In cover application, we don't have to worry about chemistry so much, whereas in liner applications, we do at different stresses as well. We'll talk about that as we go forward. Um, but it's pretty amazing. But it's all contingent, and, and a lot of, how many people here are civil engineers? Geotechnical engineers? Okay, but a lot of people are civil engineers, and civil engineering and chemistry often are like at a, at a crossroads. They're, they're, uh, but the geochemistry is really important to these materials. They function based on the geochemistry. But fortunately, uh, we can distill that down into some pretty uh, practical uh, principles. But what, this is what we start off with, with a GCL. If you look at the cross-section of a GCL when you get it uh, at, at the job site, and if you cut it open, you would see essentially two non-woven geotextiles, usually non-wovens, uh, with some needle punching uh, between them, and something that looks sand-like. Particularly in the US, we use essentially sand-sized granules of bentonite. So that's what you start with, and that doesn't look very impermeable. Right? And it looks actually like a, like a sand filter you might use for drinking water treatment. And it, for it to be effective, it needs to transform itself from this to this type of material. This is actually a GCL that I exhumed in, um, out in the uh, east of Los Angeles in the desert that was in a composite barrier system in place for about 10 years. It had transformed itself from this granular material to this gel. And whether that, trans that transformation has to occur for these materials to be effective. That's what makes the, them impervious. It's the formation of that gel structure. And that depends on the geochemistry. These are macro scale pores you can see them with your eye. These are nanoscale pores. Actually, I always say geotechnical engineers were the first nanotechnologists, the first nanoscientists. All this new stuff, we were at it first, right? And these, these are, these are nanoscale pores. We, and that's why the water flows so slowly through them, right? It's really fine pores. That's one of my geotechnical jokes. You have to laugh a little bit, all right? Um, but it all depends on the geochemistry, right? It, that whether we get that transformation depends on the geochemistry. And we can distill it down into sim simple ideas, but when you're looking at projects where you're gonna use these products, understanding the chemistry of the liquids that we need to contain uh, becomes important. 